Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to St. John the Baptist Catholic Church in New Freedom, Pennsylvania. Let us say together the prayer to St. John the Baptist. St. John, you were privileged to baptize our Savior in the Jordan, where the Father declared him as his beloved Son and sent the Holy Spirit to anoint him as the Christ for our salvation. You prepared the way of the Lord by calling us to repent of our sins through baptism in Jesus. Intercede for our parish that God's mercy will heal us in body, mind, and soul, and that God's grace will perfect us in faith, hope, and love. As we celebrate this Mass today, may your voice once again draw us to the Word of God who teaches us in spirit and in truth. May your voice once again lead us to the Lamb of God who feeds us with the bread from heaven. Throughout our lives, may we follow your example of courage in testifying to the light, so that one day we may be welcomed with joy to the banquet feast of eternal life. Amen. St. John the Baptist, pray for us. Please take a moment to silence all cell phones and other electronic devices. Today we celebrate the third Sunday of Lent, the intention of this Mass is for Don Baumiller, and our priest will be Father Cavender. The entrance hymn is There's a Wideness in God's Mercy and can be found in your worship aid. Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. the Lord be with you. My brothers and sisters, let us acknowledge our sins and so prepare ourselves to celebrate the sacred mysteries. Lord Jesus, you came to reconcile us to one another. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Lord Jesus, you heal the wounds of sin and division. Christ, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord Jesus, you intercede for us with the Father. 
Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. May Almighty God have mercy on us, forgive us our sins, and bring us to everlasting life. Let us pray. O God, author of every mercy and of all goodness, who in fasting, prayer, and almsgiving have shown us a remedy for sin, look graciously on this confession of our lowliness, that we who are bowed down by our conscience may always be lifted up by your mercy. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God forever and ever. Amen. A reading from the book of Exodus. In those days, in their thirst for water, the people grumbled against Moses, saying, Why did you ever make us leave Egypt? Was it just to have us die here of thirst with our children and our livestock? So Moses cried out to the Lord, What shall I do with these people? A little more, and they will stone me. The Lord answered Moses, Go over there in front of the people, along with some of the elders of Israel, holding in your hand as you go the staff with which you struck the river. I will be standing there in front of you on the rock in Horeb. Strike the rock, and the water will flow from it for the people to drink. This Moses did in the presence of the elders of Israel. The place was called Massa and Meribah because the Israelites quarreled there and tested the Lord, saying, Is the Lord in our midst or not? The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. sweeter and sweeter are they than honey 
Then honey flowing from the comb. Lord, you have the words of everlasting life. A reading from the letter of St. Paul to the Romans. Brothers and sisters, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith to this grace in which we stand, and we boast in hope of the glory of God. And hope does not disappoint, because the love of God has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. For Christ, while we were still helpless, died at the appointed time for the ungodly. Indeed, only the difficulty does one die for a just person, though perhaps for a good person, one might even find courage to die. But God proves his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to John. Jesus came to a town of Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of land that Jacob had given his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there. Jesus, tired from his journey, sat down there at the well. It was about noon. A woman, a woman of Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, give me a drink. His disciples had gone into the town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, how can you, a Jew, ask me, a Samaritan woman, for a drink? For Jews use nothing in common with Samaritans. Jesus answered and said to her, if you knew the gift of God and who is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, sir, you don't even have a bucket and the cistern is deep. Where then can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us the cistern and drank from it himself? with his children and his flocks. Jesus answered and said to her, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water I shall give will never thirst. The water I shall give will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, 
Sir, give me this water so that I am so that I may not be thirsty or have to keep coming here to draw water. Jesus said to her, go call your husband and come back. The woman answered and said to him, I do not have a husband. Jesus answered her, you are right in saying, I do not have a husband, for you have had five husbands and the one you have now is not your husband. What you have said is true. The woman said to him, Sir, I can see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshiped on this mountain, but you people say the place to worship is in Jerusalem. Jesus said to her, Believe me, woman, the hour is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. Your, you people worship what you do not understand. We worship what we understand, because salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is here now, when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. And indeed, the Father seeks such people to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to him, I know that the Messiah is coming, the one called the Christ. When he comes, he will tell us everything. Jesus said to her, I am he, the one speaking with you. At that moment, his disciples returned and were amazed that he was talking with a woman. But still, no one said, what are you looking for? Or why are you talking with her? The woman left her water jar and went into the town and said to the people, Come see a man who told me everything I have done. Could he possibly be the Christ? They went out of the town and came to him. Meanwhile, the disciples urged him, Rabbi, eat. But he said to them, I have food to eat of which you do not know. So the disciples said to one another, Could someone have brought him something to eat? Jesus said to them, My food is to do the will of the one who sent me and to finish his work. Do you not say, In four months the harvest will be here? I tell you, look up and see the fields ripe for the harvest. The reaper is already receiving payment and gathering crops for eternal life, so that the sower and reaper can rejoice together. For here the saying is verified that one sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap what you have not worked for. Others have done the work, you, and you are sharing the fruits of their work. Many of the Samaritans of that town began to believe in him because of the word of the woman who testified, he has told me everything I have done. When the Samaritans came to him, they invited him to stay with them, and he stayed there two days. Many more began to believe in him because of his word, and they said to the woman, we no longer believe because of your word, for we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this is truly the savior of the world. For world. Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. I think we just heard most of the Gospel of John, right? It's okay, it's my favorite Gospel, so it's always good to read John. Uh, we'll have to do a, a after the Revelation class is done, we'll have to do a Bible study on the Gospel of John. That'll be a, that'll be a good one for this, uh, for this summer, something like that. Anyway, this weekend we start the scrutinies for our candidates and our catechumens. And as the readings from the scrutinies, and I can't think of a better reading to be able to have than this woman at the well. And there's so many things going on that are so applicable. Right? The, the scrutinies are about how the church would, from the earliest and most ancient times, 
pass on the faith, the most fundamental pieces of our faith, to those coming to meet Jesus Christ, who have met him at the well in their own life and have decided that this is the relationship that I need in my life. So what we see in this, in this gospel is this central longing for God that each of us have that, that only Jesus Christ can fulfill that. But there's this problem that, that, this, that this relationship with God has been impeded, cut off by sin. That, that, that we can either have our sins or we can have God, but we can't have both. Right? And that, that once we experience Christ and Christ repairs that rift in our life, that there's nothing like it. And that we go and proclaim that to everybody in our life. Right? So this is the fundamental things of the faith. So let's, take a di- let's dive into this passage and take a look at some of the quick pieces. And we're pretty fr- we've heard this passage before. Right? We know about this, this woman goes to the well at noon because of her scandalous relationships, right? She's had five husbands, and she's, uh, she's working on candidate number six, right? And, and okay, small town Samaria, it's kind of like small town America. Everybody's talking about everything that happens to everybody, okay? And she doesn't want to deal with all of the gossip and all of the judgmental looks that are going to come out in the morning when all the other women come out and get the water early in the morning when it's not hot and nasty in the middle of the day. So she decides that she would rather deal with the hot, nasty weather in the middle of the day than dealing with all of the gossip that's going to happen early in the morning. Okay, And so, so now we run into Jesus. And so right, he, he starts with this whole thing where he, he says, all right, well, I can give you water that you won't have to come back here anymore. Of course, we realize that he's talking about baptism, this relationship with him, that he's going to well up with inside of us this amazing gift of, of life, that, that we'll be connected to the source of life, and that will, be, that will become itself a spring inside of us. She doesn't understand that yet, but she just realizes, like, I would do anything to not have to come back to this stupid well. This, this reminder of the brokenness of my life. This reminder of everything that I've done wrong. And yet, so, right, so she goes, and she's like, please, like, give me this water. I'll do anything for it to not have to come back to this well. And then he seems to take a left-hand turn. He's like, all right, well, bring your husband. I don't have a husband. You're right, you, have, you, have, don't have, uh, you don't have a husband. You have five husbands, and the one you're with now is not he. Right? It's not your husband. So, right, it seems like Jesus has just taken this left-hand turn. What he's doing is that he's repairing the rift. That there's this sin in her life that is blocking her ability to receive the well at the center of her life. We have to take care of the sin, Once we take care of the sin, then you can have the well. So it gets into this fundamental reality that like Christ is going to give us this well springing up with inside of us. Now, does that mean that like at the moment of our baptism, God God comes in with a big old well drill, you know, and, and, and basically, you know, goes goes drilling for the spiritual well in our soul? No. Because we were actually created with this well. We were created to be in this relationship with God, but it was only because Adam and Eve broke the entire human race by entering into sin, giving us original sin, that that well became cut off from its source. It stopped flowing. Now, what's a well that doesn't have any water in it? It sounds like a bad dad joke, but, right? What's a well that doesn't have any water in it? It's, it's just a pit. It's a chasm, an empty void in the earth. I think we've all experienced that a little bit at some point in time in our life. Right? We have that void where we try to fill it with whatever we want to. This woman in particular, she tried to fill it with five husbands and uh, working on number six, right? But we, we felt we, we've tried to fill it in many other ways. Right? We feel that void of that, that absence of God. 
and we try to fill it with another season of something on Netflix or whatever streaming service that we have. We've tried to fill it with a little bit more snack food. We've tried to fill it with a little bit more money, power, whatever pleasure we want, right? Pick a pleasure, pick two pleasures, pick three pleasures. It doesn't matter. That's a God-shaped hole right in the middle of our heart, and it doesn't matter what we can try to throw in there to try to medicate it away. Nothing will be able to fill that void that was made to be the spring of life connected to God himself. We could throw the whole world in there, and it still would not be enough. You know, the famous line, how much more money do you need? More. It's because we were made for God. And Christ has come to restore that well, to not have it be a pit in our life, but to become the wellspring of his life, flowing up with inside of us, refreshing us, and making us whole again. That is what we are handing on to our candidates and our catechumens in this moment of the scrutinies. But so how do we actually then make this well a, a spring within, you know, within us? How do we allow Christ to work in us to be able to make that become a spring? And that comes back to the, let's, let's go back to that, uh, uh, that, that phrase that Jesus said, you have had five husbands and the one you are with now is not your husband. There's a lot of things going on in that phrase. Number one, he's literally pointing out that, that like, Right, the sin in her life that he has to remove in order to be able to make this well work. That's like the literal meaning. We have this connection to the Old Testament, and I'd love to get into that right now because it's amazing, but uh, the Samaritans, they were the, they, they were the ten northern tribes of Israel, more or less, and they were attacked by Syria, and then Syria intermarried with them, and then, and then they basically had five tribes worshiping false gods. That, that Samaria has had five husbands and Jesus Christ now is not the one who she is with, right? So we step into this whole nuptial imagery. Jacob's well is very important. That was where he met his wife, Rachel. And so there's this whole nuptial image that we see at Jacob's well. So in a sense, Jesus is spiritually courting this, this Samaritan woman. And we start to see this whole image of the church as the bride of Christ. Come and be part of my bride. That means that like, God is using this whole image of marriage to be an image of how he, he is in a relationship with his people that it becomes a life-giving spring inside of us. It's not like God was looking out at his creation before uh, before, you know, he, he was like, man, the human race really broke. Like, how am I going to fix this? Well, they get married. That seems like a pretty nice thing of love that we, could, that we could work with. Like, let's use that. God wasn't surprised that marriage happened to end up in his, in his creation. He actually wrote marriage as a sacrament of his love for the world and the, the world's relationship back with him. Naturally, and then supernaturally is the sacrament of marriage. Which brings us to a really important spiritual point that more or less the rules for our spiritual life and the rules for marriage are vastly the same. If we look at our relationship with Jesus Christ, how do we describe Jesus Christ? He's patient, he's kind, he's quick to forgive, he's slow to anger. Right? He doesn't hold on to past wrongs. Doesn't all that sound really nice for a marriage? Like, if we actually lived by those rules within our own marriage, wouldn't everybody be like the holiest couples you've ever heard of in your life? That'd be amazing. On the other side, what if we looked at our spiritual life and put it through the marriage test? Would one hour a week with our spouse be enough to have a good relationship? Marriage is, a, is not 50-50, it's 100-100, right? Do we apply that to our spiritual life, that our relationship with God is, we give ourselves 100% to God and he gives himself 100% back, right? What, what about, uh, like, do we go to bed angry with God in our life and let that stew in us? The rules for marriage and the rules for our spiritual life are vastly interchangeable. We can put our spiritual life 
through the marriage test and we can put our marriage through the spiritual life test. All right, so when we allow that relationship to have that deep union with Jesus Christ in our life, then it becomes this spring welling up from inside of us so that when we receive the sacraments, when we receive baptism for, the candidate, for, the, for our catechumens, when we receive our first Holy Communion for our candidates, when we ourselves come to confession and have this interaction with the Eucharist week after week, that Christ is not this, this empty pit, this obligation that we have to fulfill, but he is a life-giving spring that gives life and meaning to everything else we do for the rest of the week. Allow Christ, through that deep relationship, to become that life-giving spring, and everything else in our life will be perfected, made holy, and have meaning through him. This time I'd like to ask our catechumens and their sponsors to please come forward. Today we celebrate the first scrutiny. We have three scrutinies, the third, fourth, and fifth Sundays of Lent for our catechumens, those who are preparing for baptism. And for those who have been to an infant baptism recently, you know right before the baptism, there is called the prayer of exorcism, uh, where we pray over them. We anoint them with the oil on the chin with the sign of the cross. Uh, and it's a pre-baptismal anointing that points to the power that they're going to receive from Christ to throw out, and that's what exercise means, to cast out or throw out, to throw out Satan, sin, and evil from their life. And so these three scrutinies are pre-baptismal anointings uh, in that way as an exorcism to show that the power that they will receive at the Easter Vigil in their baptism will be the power of Christ himself to cast out evil, sin, and all things dark from their life. And these scrutinies are based on the readings. We just heard the uh, uh, story of the woman at the well. And so each of these three scrutinies uh, are based on the theology uh, of those uh, stories for those uh, gospels each of those weeks. But dear friends, let us now pray for our elect in the church that God has chosen, that he may successfully complete their long preparation and the Paschal feast that Christ will give to them the sacraments of life. At this time, we're just going to bow our heads for a moment and just pray for the coming of the Holy Spirit upon them as we prepare for this, uh, this scrutiny. This time I'm going to ask the catechumens to please kneel. And sponsors, if you could please place your right hand on the right shoulder of your candidate. A response to the word of uh, the prayer of the faithful will be, Lord, hear our prayer. That these catechumens may ponder the word of God in their hearts and savor its meaning more fully day by day, we pray to the Lord that they may learn to know Christ who came to save what was lost, we pray to the Lord. Lord that they may humbly confess themselves to be sinners, let us pray to the Lord. Lord that they may sincerely reject everything in their lives that is displeasing and contrary to Christ, we pray to the Lord. Lord that the Holy Spirit who searches every heart may help them to overcome their weakness through his power, we pray to the Lord. Lord that the same Holy Spirit may teach them to know the things of God and how to please him, we pray to the Lord. Lord that their families may also put their hope in Christ and find peace and holiness in him, we pray to the Lord. Lord that we ourselves, in preparation for the Easter feast, may seek a change of heart, give ourselves to prayer, 
and persevere in our good works, we pray to the Lord. Lord that throughout this whole world, whatever is weak may be strengthened, whatever is broken, restored, whatever is lost, found, and what is found, redeemed, we pray to the Lord. We pray for all our parishioners who are ill, especially Mary Ayers Collins and all those listed in the Book of the Sick. May they be healed, may the dying be comforted, and may their caregivers be renewed in spirit. We pray to the Lord. Lord and we pray that Norma Hiltz and Dorothy Ayers and all who have died may be raised up with Christ and seated in the glory of heaven. We pray to the Lord. God of power, you sent your Son to be our Savior. Grant that these catechumens, who, like the woman of Samaria, thirst for living water, may turn to the Lord as they hear his word and acknowledge the sins and weaknesses that weigh them down. Protect them from vain reliance on self and defend them from the power of Satan. Free them from the spirit of deceit so that, admitting the wrong they have done, they may attain purity of heart and advance on the way of salvation we ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Lord Jesus, you are the fountain for which they thirst. You are the master whom they seek. In your presence, they dare not claim to be without sin, for you alone are the Holy One of God. Today, they open their hearts to you in faith. They confess their faults and lay bare their hidden wounds. In your love, free them from their infirmities, heal their sickness, quench their thirst, and give them peace. In the power of your name, which we call upon in faith. Stand by them now and heal them. Rule over that spirit of evil, conquered by your rising from the dead. Show your elect the way of salvation in the Holy Spirit, that they may come to worship the Father in truth. For you live and reign forever and ever. Amen. My dear friends, our parish of St. John's now sends you forth to reflect more deeply upon the word of God, which you have shared with us today at this Mass. Be assured of our loving support and prayers for you, and we look forward to the day when you will share fully in the Lord's table with us.
God's precepts keep us, their purpose is right. They gladden the hearts of people. God's command is so clear, it brings us to vision, bringing God's light to our hearts. Brothers and sisters, that my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God, the Almighty Father. Be pleased, O Lord, with these sacrificial offerings and grant that we who beseech pardon for our own sins may take care to forgive our neighbor through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly right and just, our duty and our salvation, always and everywhere to give you thanks, Lord, Holy Father, almighty and eternal God, through Christ our Lord. For when he asked the Samaritan woman for, a, for water to drink, he had already created the gift of faith within her, and so ardently did he thirst for her faith, that he kindled in her the fire of divine love. And so we too give you thanks, and with angels praise your mighty deeds as we acclaim. Sanctus, Sanctus, Sanctus Dominus Deus Indeed, holy, O Lord, and all you have created rightly gives you praise. For through your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, by the power and working of the Holy Spirit, you give life to all things and make them holy. And you never cease to gather a people to yourself, so that from the rising of the sun to its setting, a pure sacrifice may be offered to your name. Therefore, O Lord, we humbly implore you by the same Spirit, graciously make holy these gifts we have brought to you for consecration, that they may become the body and blood of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, at whose command we celebrate these mysteries. For on the night he was betrayed, he himself took bread, and giving thanks, and giving you thanks, he said the blessing, broke the bread, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and eat of it. For this is my body, which will be given up for you. In a similar way, when supper was ended, he took the chalice, and giving you thanks, he said the blessing, and gave the chalice to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and drink from it, for this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins, do this in memory of me.
the mystery of faith. Save us, Savior of the world, for by your cross and resurrection you have set us free. Therefore, O Lord, as we celebrate the memorial of the saving passion of your Son, his wondrous resurrection and ascension into heaven, and as we look forward to his second coming, we offer you in thanksgiving this holy and living sacrifice. Look, we pray, upon the oblation of your church, and recognizing the sacrificial victim by whose death you willed to reconcile us to yourself, grant that we, who are nourished by the body and blood of your Son and filled with his Holy Spirit, may become one body, one spirit in Christ. May he make of us an eternal offering to you so that we may obtain an inheritance with your elect, especially with the most blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of God, with blessed Joseph, her spouse, with your blessed apostles and glorious martyrs, with St. Patrick, St. John the Baptist, and with all the saints on whose constant intercession in your presence we rely for unfailing help. May this sacrifice of our reconciliation, we pray, O Lord, advance the peace and salvation of all the world. Be pleased to confirm in faith and charity your pilgrim church on earth, with your servant Francis our Pope and Ronald our Bishop, the order of bishops, all the clergy, and the entire people you have gained for your own. Listen graciously to the prayers of this family whom you have summoned before you. In your compassion, O merciful Father, gather to yourself all your children scattered throughout the world. And to our departed brothers and sisters, and to all who are pleasing to you at their passing from this life, give kind admittance to your kingdom. There we hope to enjoy forever the fullness of your glory through Christ our Lord, through whom you bestow on the world all that is good. Through him and with him and in him, O God, Almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours forever and ever. Amen. At the Savior's command and formed by divine teaching, we dare to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Deliver us, Lord, we pray, from every evil. Graciously grant peace in our days that by the help of your mercy, we may always be free from sin and safe from all distress as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Lord Jesus Christ, who said to your apostles, peace I leave you, my peace I give you, look not on our sins, but on the faith of your church and graciously grant her peace and unity in accordance with your will, who live and reign forever and ever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. And with your spirit. On your stay, we truly stack us Amen. Yeah. 
Behold the Lamb of God. Behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb. Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof, but only say the word and my soul shall be healed.
our prayer, O Lord God of hosts, receive our lives into your hands. Look into the hearts of those you love and grant us all we need. Oh, how lovely is your dwelling place, dwelling of the Lord of hosts. How we long for your house, O Lord, singing out a song of joy to the living God. For one day within your house exceeds a thousand spent away from earth. We would rather serve within your house than wealth and power receive. Oh, how lovely
Let us pray. As we receive the pledge of things yet hidden in heaven and are nourished while still on earth with the bread that comes from on high, we humbly entreat you, O Lord, that what is being brought about in us in mystery may come to true completion through Christ our Lord. Amen. A few announcements. Um, uh, please join us for this upcoming, uh, this upcoming Friday, March 12th, for the next Lenten dinner from 4 to 7 p.m. Uh, enjoy good food at, the, uh, at, at a good price, no tax, no tips, and free beverages. Yes. Um, the, uh, the, and the Christmas Bazaar team will also have uh, raffle tickets available for purchase. Uh, there will be a Mass on, on the, for the Feast of St. Joseph on Friday, March 19th at 7 p.m. Uh, stations will be at 6 p.m. For, uh, for that day only. Uh, so just be aware of that schedule change there. Mass is at 7 p.m., which is when we normally have stations, so we'll do stations at 6 p.m. Uh, and and uh, there is also, uh, because this is the year of St. Joseph, and it is the Feast of St. Joseph, and it falls on Friday, this is one of the rare few times that we get to eat as much meat as we want on a Friday in Lent. So get it in now, because you never know when these things are going to happen again. Okay? Um, but we are dispensed from the, uh, from, from the uh, meat fast on, from abstinence on, uh, on, on this Friday in Lent because of, or sorry, St. Joseph's on, uh, uh, for, Friday, for that Friday in Lent. Uh, if, if you haven't received uh, the diocesan annual campaign in the mail, we do have them here if you want to take them with you. I know there's been some, some tension with this, uh, but just realize like, I mean, I, so my other job here is campus ministry up at York. And we just had the seat conference. Many of you maybe have seen some of the talks from those, from like Father Mike Schmitz and Bishop Barron and stuff like that. We took 40 kids this year to seek digitally, which is like what many D1 colleges do. And that's only made possible because the, the diocesan, diocesan annual campaign funds all of campus ministry. Okay, if you've ever received like a check from the diocese or gone through the annulment process or, or done like the men's conference, the women's conference, all of that stuff, is funded through the diocesan annual campaign. So please, uh, uh, I know there's been some tension, but please be generous as you guys always are, okay? So thank you in advance for that. All right. Please be seated for a moment. I've got one sad announcement to make and uh, deals with what we all deal with in life and uh, the, the circle of life, the aging of our parents and loved ones and health struggles that they have. So uh, my parents are going through some more serious health struggles these last uh, five and six months. And uh, so my, in consultation with my brothers and sisters and, and uh, talking about things, you know, the bishops have always been good in our diocese about allowing us to get closer uh, to help them out in their time of need. So uh, I've asked if it's possible that I can move closer this spring uh, to help them out. Uh, I haven't talked about their health issues. Um, they're very private people, said so I didn't want me to, but they also have a sense of humor uh, because they said, you know, we know you stream down there, so don't be telling our health issues, you know, so it's blasted all over the, uh, the, you know, the website and the Facebook and all that stuff. And don't tell them we're the last ones on the conveyor belt, you know? I said, no, okay. Uh, so, but uh, uh, 12 years ago, I think it was 12 years ago now, um, my mom and dad faced their first serious health issue, uh, first time ever. And within a month and a half, uh, a diagnosis uh, for each of them. Uh, my mom had a brain tumor, and my dad was diagnosed with a very rare and aggressive cancer. And you know, you think your parents are invincible, you know, you all think that, you know, until something really happens, it hit us like a Mack truck. And uh, so we're like, so, you know, like, well, we, we just really thought we we're preparing for two funerals. Um, but after their surgeries and after their radiation, uh, they not only recovered, but they rebounded so well. Unbelievable. Testimony to our, our advanced medicine today, and also for me personally, I think uh, really a small double miracle. So, uh, and they've been doing very well for a period of time. So I was in Harrisburg at the time. They had recovered. When they asked me to be transferred to southern um, Lancaster County, Quarryville, I did not want to go. Um, you know, I was so close, I was only 15 minutes away, and this is right after they recovered from all this. And, but then I thought, you know, they're in good health. Uh, they rebounded so well, and if I'm asked to serve there, I will go. And, and so I did. 
and I'm only there three years, and then they asked me again, uh, we need you here at St. John's. I'm like, uh, I'm only halfway through my term. I want to finish this term, and then you can move me, you know? Um, and, but again, I said, you know what? With the, the double miracle they had, I have good health. Um, you know, if I'm called to serve here, I will, and that's why I came. Um, so everything was smooth from, from way 12 years ago until just four years ago um, when my dad got very, very sick and ill, and uh, he took, we took him to the hospital, and they were running all kinds of tests, and uh, then they finally did a catheter and catheterization, and uh, the doctor came out and said, he's not coming home today. We're doing emergency surgery. So make a long story short, he had a triple bypass. He uh, was diagnosed with AFib, um, and he struggled after. It was like, he's, he not, he, when he got home, he was not even home like four days. He had to go back in for an emergency surgery again. Came back home, had to go back in again for an emergency surgery. So it was a long, long process. But he finally got through his um, rehab, his heart, uh, cardiac rehab, and was doing pretty good. And um, so I wrote a letter four years ago to the bishop, uh, again, just explaining to the bishop and the personnel board uh, their health issues and everything else. And I said, but they're in good health, so I, I want to remain here uh, as pastor at St. John the Baptist. And so, but in the last five and six months, their, their conditions um, uh, have been experiencing some difficulties. Um, it, my mom um, has taken in, well, first of all, my dad was taken in emergency in the fall and with, um, uh, great, a lot of pain. We didn't know. We were hoping it was a kidney stone. It wasn't. They still don't even know what it was. Then my mom had to go in two times for uh, procedures for uh, internal bleeding. And then, um, and then my mom was just diagnosed before Christmas and had a tumor removed before Christmas. Um, went back for a checkup a week and a half ago, and uh, they found more tumors. Um, so that will, she'll have more surgery in the spring. And then um, my dad was diagnosed on top of all this now just with uh, um, a, a, a leaking uh, aortic heart valve, uh, which has now progressed to stage two. So we're getting near the danger point. Uh, and the problem is that they were hoping they can do a catheterization a repair, uh, but they will not commit that he's a candidate for that. And he does not want to get his chest cut open again. So if he doesn't get the surgery, then, you know, it's just, you know, deterioration, uh, in, you know, either rapidly or slowly, I don't know how. Um, so anyway, uh, that's, that's kind of where they're at now. And in the last three years, they've lost all the rest of their siblings. Um, I celebrated funerals for my dad's aunt, and, or my dad's sister, my mom's brother, and on Friday night, my mom's younger sister, uh, Aunt Andrea, uh, she passed away. Uh, so they don't have anybody right now. Uh, they're depending, they're gonna depend on us kids uh, to take care of them. Uh, so that's what we intend to do. So this week, I, I'll be out a day or two. Um, we're meeting with the funeral director tomorrow, um, so we'll probably have the funeral later this week. Uh, but I just want to conclude by uh, saying that I want to uh, thank you for uh, your great faith and your great example of love. And um, I've witnessed that here over and over again for six years. And uh, especially with you, um, all of you who have taken care of your parents uh, or your spouses and um, taking care of them in their time of need and uh, as they're dying. And um, I've made it a point uh, in every funeral homily at the very beginning to thank you uh, for taking care of your parents or your spouse because it was such an inspiration to me, tremendous inspiration. And so many of you are doing that right now, taking care of your parents and your spouses who are very ill and sick. And uh, that's a wonderful, wonderful thing. Uh, many times you think that the priest is the one you look to for, you know, priest, clergy, for inspiration and faith, and that's true in a certain way. Um, but it's just equally as true uh, that we look to you for inspiration of faith as well. Uh, our faith grows because of your faith. And I've commented, uh, com commented many times on your heroic faith and uh, in seeing that, uh, has inspired me so much. Uh, so I, I ask for your continued prayers. I know you've been praying, and uh, now you're updated with everything. So just the uh, mom and dad are, right now, they are uh, fully functional at home. Um, they're, they're, they're doing well. They're, they've slowed down a lot. My mom's surgeries have really slowed her down. My dad can't do what he used to do. As a matter of fact, I was lucky in that the major snowstorms happened on Sunday and Monday when I was home. Uh, my dad can't, he's not allowed to shovel or exert himself, he'll, he'll, he'll die. So I was there to help him shovel out uh, those days. So, um, but they're fully functional at home, 
and uh, we hope to keep it that way for a while. So, but I just want to uh, thank you for uh, your great love. I, I have no idea where I might be going. That I won't know for months now. Uh, so anyway, I'll let you know when that's all happening. And I'll have more to tell you. But uh, just thank you for uh, the great blessing and the great example of faith you have been to me. Thank you. We will certainly be praying for Father Bob and his family. Okay, this is, uh, this is a parish family, and uh, family of Father Bob's is family of ours, right? So we're gonna pray for them, absolutely. So, the Lord be with you. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go forth, the Mass is ended. Thanks, Thanks be to, to God. God.